So again, Jana Riggins, UIL, State Office, and very, very glad that you are here. I'm delighted to turn this session over to our state contest director. What a year to be the new contest director when we do a virtual state <laughs> tournament. But Ann Schaffner, uh, Ann will uh, be, has been just amazing this year in all ways of rolling with the flow. And also Darren Ard. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about Anne. Most of you that I see in the chat who have identified yourself probably know Anne. Very experienced, coached for almost four decades at Tascosa Amarillo High School. Uh, she's been inducted into just about every Hall of Fame that she could possibly be. You'll see that on the screen there. And just a delight to work with and super excited to be your new state contest director in extemporaneous speaking. Also, the master wizard who very ably conducted a virtual extemp draw at our state meet in May. And that was Darren Ong from Holiday ISD. He is an AP English teacher and he coaches multiple academic events and you will see how successful on the screen there. He's had five different UIL events that have had state champions. We first remember Darren as a student in extemporaneous speaking and highly successful, qualified for the state meet three different times. And you can see that this year his school is the academic state champions for Conference 3A. So we're delighted that Ann and Darren have put their expertise together and will share with you what they have seen through the years. Both Ann and Darren have worked the state extent draw for many years. And so they've seen a lot of interesting things that I think you're going to be uh, really uh, interested in seeing today. Let's talk about the most valuable prep time. How do you train your extemporaneous speakers to use that 30 minute prep time as wisely as possible? So Ann and Darren, I turn it over to you now. Thank you, Jana. Good morning, everybody. We're so appreciative of you showing up this morning. You know, one of the big fears of doing these Zoom meetings where it's a volunteer type thing is that nobody's going to show up. And so you're just kind of talking to one another. So we do appreciate you getting up this morning and joining in with us. Uh, as Jana said, Darren and I have worked extemp draw together at UIL State for several years. I hear so many people, so many coaches say, oh, I would hate working extemp draw. Well, oddly enough, Darren and I really enjoy it because we have learned so much from being an extemp draw and we normally work with Dwight Mutchler, uh, who normally in, in the real world would run the extemp draw at UIL State. And so we're gonna give him a shout out here right quick. Um, but Darren and I tend to monitor. And so we've been going up and down the aisles, watching the students as they're getting ready to prep. And we kind of got together and decided, you know, there are some things there that we think coaches need to know, teachers need to be teaching in their classroom that might possibly take that mediocre extemper up to the next level or even that excellent extemper up to a state championship level. Um, I, there are some of these things that after Darren and I were talking to each other and putting this all together, I even was learning some things that he had picked up off of watching kids in extemp draw. And uh, uh, I, maybe he picked up something from me, who knows. Um, but uh, we, we just kind of wanted to go through some of these things with you. And we want to talk about when does extemp prep actually begin? And we both agreed that it begins before the tournament because you've got all of these little things like a day or two before the tournament that you need to make sure that you take care of. So we're going to talk about some of those things right quick. First of all, there's some things you need to check. And one of those is your file boxes. Now, granted, so many of you now go to computers for your extent files, and you've got these different programs, or you're putting together your own files. But if you're still carrying file boxes, even if you have computers, we still see file boxes come in with the computers because that's how they're carrying their computers. 
or they've got their flow pads and pencils and things like that in some type of a file box or a container. Check those file boxes. Make sure that you know what the UIL rules are in regards to what you can have with you in extemp draw. And those file boxes oftentimes are where we find note cards that have already been used in a round, uh, speeches that have already been used, or um, are, are items that you used, the students used back at school to just go through and maybe write down some things that they needed to know about particular current events that they've just stuck back in those file boxes that are basically could be just, you know, described as outlines from speeches. So check the file boxes. Darren and I can both tell you that we, we kind of have a different approach to checking things before a tournament. My approach, well, Darren, you tell them your approach. As far as my approach for the file boxes are concerned, uh, I like to be the one responsible because I feel like as a coach, I have have to be the one that that takes care of all the details. Um, and so even though I've been out of it for a while, as far as coaching uh, the extent events, uh, whenever I was still coaching those file boxes, I went through them with a fine tooth comb just to make sure that there were no uh, illegal articles or, or file uh, note cards, uh, past speeches, because I felt like uh, when the students would practice at home, um, they would just being a, a race to get out of the, my room usually in order to to run off and do their own thing after practice um, and so a lot of times those speeches did get dropped into uh, those last file folders uh, that they had been using so i felt like it was my responsibility as their coach and on the other hand my my approach is i always put my students responsible they're the ones that are going to be in the draw room being caught with things that may be illegal in those boxes and they need to be able to answer for those things. Now, here was the catch to what I did. I always told my students, you are responsible for what's on your computer, for what's in the file boxes, and you know this is my way of teaching you what to look for in those boxes. And so if they can go through and take out all the illegal items themselves, then I didn't have to worry about it. But I still did. So if when once they all left school and they told me, yes, we cleaned out the file boxes, we checked all the computers, everything is good. I gave them time to get away from school and then I checked them myself. They never knew that. And uh, well, some of them now that are coaching probably do. But uh, I always made sure that I was the last one to check the boxes. So Basically, Darren and I are kind of doing the same thing of we're the last ones to check those boxes, but I placed the big responsibility on my extempers because they were going to be the ones in that extemp draw room having to answer for anything that was in those files. And I might not be in that draw room with them, so they would need to be able to answer for that. Um, Darren, why don't you talk about what we look for on the computers? Okay. Um, whether it's the file boxes or the computers, ultimately, from what you've heard from uh, from me and from Ann, it's up for you to you to decide what sort of coaching philosophy you're going to want to uh, have with your individual team. Uh, ultimately, I was always scared that uh, that a teammate would leave something in there inadvertently, and they may not even be competing at the next tournament. And then the teammate would get the other teammate in trouble. So I always felt like it was my responsibility, uh, but that's up to you as a coach in order to determine that. The number one thing that we find uh, in the prep room, at least at the state meet, uh, as far as the computer use is concerned, unfortunately happens to be in two areas. First area is for students, extempers who are also debaters. Uh, we have found that they tend to leave or use the, the same uh, computer for both uh, debate and for extemp, and that's just not allowed in the prep room. Um, and so we, we have seen that. The second thing that we have seen that students have, have been doing with their computers is that a lot of them want to actually do their flow, their organization of their speech on the computer, whereas the UIL rules specify that 
um, the computers are used for research only, not for actually flowing. And the danger in that uh, for both of us as prep room monitors at the state meet is if a student is flowing on that particular computer, maybe they have a Word document up. We don't know at that point because we haven't been watching them you know, minute by minute within their their prep time, we don't know if that was a, a pre-organized speech or not. So please make sure that you encourage your students to one, remove any debate material, illegal material from those computers, but also not to flow, not even think about flowing on their computer that itself. Use it for research purposes only. Two years ago, we were gladly trying to track down a, uh, a flash drive for it was before draw had ever started and we happened to walk by and see a little girl that had her debate case her ld case up on her computer because she was going from extemp straight into doing ld and so we walked over we told her that needs to be pulled off there do you have a flash drive to put it on she didn't so we were madly rushing around there trying to find this young lady a, a flash drive so that we could remove her uh, case off of her computer so you know just please be sure that you're watching for those things um the other thing that we're, we're looking at um is note cards uil does say that you can have a note card whenever you go in to give your speech and um what we're what we're looking for is note cards that may be left over in the files that maybe in their flow pad it got put in the back of their of their flow pad or something. We'll look at the note card. If the note card is on the topic that they're speaking on that day, that's fine. You know, they can have that out there. But if we look and see that there are two or three note cards sitting out there, then we become concerned at that point. So make sure that your students know, <coughs> excuse me, that they are only allowed to have that note card that they are working on at that point. And that's one of the things that they need to check before the tournament is to see if there are any note cards um, left in that in that particular file. They may, my extempers would come in and use our files to research for their social studies classes too. And they would make notes, you know, and, and sometimes drop them in there and then forget that they were in the files. So make sure that those note cards are cleaned out too. The next thing we're going to talk about is the specialty of Darren's. I swear in, in extemp draw, he finds more of these things than what I can even possibly think of. So Darren, I'm going to leave it up to you to talk about the notepads. The notepads, this is where Ann and I have hated being in the, the extemp prep room at State because we feel like the, the gotcha police trying to uh, disqualify people. And that is not our job. Our job is to try to make sure that at the very least, the state draw room prep room is putting every student on equal grounds uh, as far as their preparation of their speeches are concerned. And so what Ann and I do before really before draw ever really starts for the first speaker, um, we are uh, moving around the room just looking and visiting with kids, but looking at their their material that they're prepping uh, with. And unfortunately, what we end up finding a lot of times is just what Ann posted as uh, the picture with the pencil and the, the legal pad. If you notice uh, in that picture of the legal pad, there are pages flipped over the top of that legal pad. <clears throat> and that's a telltale sign for both of us that there's something on that paper. And so unfortunately, we have been on the bad side of things where extempers have brought a legal pad in and their entire season of speeches, whether it be competitive or practice speeches, have all been on that same legal pad. And that tells us that somewhere someone has not been monitoring prep rooms uh, over and over and over again. And so we try to circumvent that from the very beginning <clears throat> before students ever start prepping speeches in order to make sure that that's removed. Because if that legal pad with past speeches, past flows, um, is in that if that pad is in that student's possession and they have already drawn their topic that is a disqualifiable offense 
Um, and so that is something that uh, Ann and I highly encourage you to check with your students, whether it's a flow pad or a, uh, a spiral um, of past speeches or past students, uh, uh, class notes even, all of those are handwritten. And so those are deemed uh, ineligible for prep room use. So please make sure before prep time ever starts that you help your students get rid of that material. And Darren, don't you think viral? I do, uh, even more so than the legal pads, because those spirals, students end up using the spiral notebooks um, for their actual coursework uh, as well. And so it, it just happens to be the scrap paper that they, they find right before they start preparing. Uh, so please make sure uh, that they don't just dig that out of their backpack of material, uh, that they're usually by the time the state meets there, it's the end of the year. And uh, they are in finals, studying for finals mode as well. And so it's especially dangerous for us at the state meet, but definitely uh, at your different invitational or district uh, or regional meets. It'll let that be something that you as a coach and uh, help to instill in your students to just not even go there with those legal pads and spirals. And I think the last, the last thing I think you need to have is a stopwatch. Um, a lot of a lot of students go to invitational tournaments and they keep their own prep time on their cell phone. Well, at at UIL, you can't have that cell phone out uh, using it at a live tournament. Now, virtual tournaments. Um, you know, you may be using your cell phone to do your uh, research and all on, but at live tournaments, I would really encourage those students to have a, their own stopwatch. That way they are always aware of how much prep time they have and can kind of monitor their own uh, preparation. So I would encourage each extemper and coaches, if you've got the budget where you can buy like five or six, I don't know, uh, stopwatch to keep in your boxes uh, to take to tournaments, I would really encourage you to do that. So that's where it all begins, is in that pre-tournament uh, checklist. When we get to the tournament and whenever Darren and I are in the draw, you know, if you're first speaker, you really don't have a whole lot of prep time because we go through announcements and then bam, they call speaker one. But if your speaker, oh, let's say, six, you've got like 50 minutes to sit there and wait. So what do you actually do? Did I lose? Can y'all see my, can y'all see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Well, I lost it on my end. So um, hang on, let me get started. Okay. So um, what we're looking at is what do we actually see in extent draw? Well, we see a lot of students who are sitting and just staring like they're off in space somewhere. They have totally zoned out and they're just, they're focusing on a wall. They're, they're, they, they're looking unhappy. And that tells us that their energy level is very low and that we might need to just drop by and kind of tap them on the shoulder, make sure that they're still with us in the draw room and make sure that not anything is, is causing them a problem, <coughs> that they're not feeling badly or something like that. But we do see these students that are just kind of staring off into space. Then Darren, what else do we see? Well, right now I'm not seeing anything in because, uh -oh. <laughs> because it's not presenting still on our end. Well, huh. let me see if I can get this going. Click resume go. slideshow, Ann. Do what? There we okay. go. Okay. There we go. The second thing that Ann and I unfortunately see, uh, as revealed in this particular picture, albeit you know a little bit younger, she's a freshman evidently, uh, a first timer. We see a lot of kids sleeping, even at the state meet, and I'm sure this is even more common at invitationals. Uh, they've traveled, left early morning, 
um, uh, especially out in West Texas where Ann and I uh, used to coach. Um, we're going to see them sleeping. And Ann and I talked about this. While that may be appropriate for a sixth speaker, possibly, um, unfortunately, the state meet, it hasn't been that successful um, simply because your brain goes into a different realm whenever they are uh, sleeping. We've had students, we even had one this year on uh, in the virtual tournament uh, whom we saw sleeping in his video. And I had called his name several times in order for him to officially draw virtually. And uh, finally he ended up waking up. So uh, please encourage your students to to stay activated in some way rather than uh, spending that time uh, just dozing. Uh, definitely not something, but we see it every year with quite a few students. It's not just a single instance. And a lot of times we don't see the second one. That's a telltale sign. <laughs> um, we see a lot of them doing things on their computer, like working on homework, uh, working on their LD debate cases. We see them playing... Uh, games on their computers those computers should be set up and ready for them to go for research only so that whenever their turn comes to speak uh to go up and draw then they are immediately tuned in to what page they need to be on now if they've got this pulled up to read a file then we think that's a great deal if if there's something big in the news that has happened that week that they want to really catch up on, then they can be on those files going through on their computer, looking at the news that they've got there. Remember in real extent draw, they can't be on the internet. Virtual, they could. So they could be reading that day's newspaper, you know, on their, on their uh, computer. But in real extent draws, they can't. So they could be pulling up one of their files on, um, whatever the the current topic is right now we, this past week we had the collapse of the apartment building there in florida and there's all kinds of questions about safety and security in those buildings and all and so that might be what they're trying to catch up on is have they discovered the, the cause of that so that's one of the things that you could also be look you know that that we also see is that kids aren't necessarily using that computer for things that would benefit them in the long run. And that's what we're concerned about is getting your mindset going so that when it's time for you to draw, you are ready and your mind is ready. The next thing that we <laughs> the next thing we see uh, obviously would be students listening to music, having headphones, uh, and I guess that 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 could be their pump up game uh, uh, strategy, uh, but probably not something that they would or should uh, be focusing on. Uh, making sure that they're focusing on that that most recent news. That's what we would like to see. Uh, in that prep room. And because Ann and I are judging a lot of our experience from that state, UIL state meet prep room, it really scares us what probably ends up occurring at those invitational meets and district meets and regional meets where it's not a, such a high stakes environment. But if we're seeing these at the state meet, it, it's quite scary. Uh, it just shouldn't happen in our opinion. <laughs> Well, and, and like we talked about earlier, if you're six speaker and you've got 50 minutes to wait, a student could go through and divide that time up of doing other things. They might want to have their headphones on just to kind of get going for like the first five minutes or so. But again, sometimes what we find is when they put those headphones on, then they start drifting off places that, you know, their mind doesn't need to be like on vacation somewhere. Um, we also see a lot of them doodling. Uh, some are very good artists. We will grant them that. We've seen some great doodles. Um, and, and sometimes they'll bring their coloring books in and color. I don't have a problem with that as long as they're not doing that for the whole 50 minutes of their wait time or their whole 20 minutes of their wait time. Utilize that prep time. Don't be doing things that are gonna get your mindset off of where it needs to be. Utilize that prep time. 
but we do see a lot of folks in there that are doodling and coloring. Um, not exactly productive use of your time is kind of how we feel about it. And the last one is a real interesting one that we see. Games. Games, <laughs> games, games, and more games. Uh, once again, it's great for relaxation purposes, but probably not exactly what you would want your students to be doing, uh, especially at the state meet. So all, all of these are things that we have seen at that state meet, obviously ways to try to, to get kids in that zone. And what Ann and I are wanting to encourage you to encourage your students to do is to get that focus on those potential topics so that they can maximize the 30 minutes that they actually do have as far as the contest. In this instance, we're talking about, let's add to their prep time. They can begin their 30 minute prep time, if you will, before that clock ever even starts. And because Ann and I have been privy to this for almost 10 years that we've been working together at the state meet, if not 10 years now, Ann, we've seen so much of this uh, beforehand. And because some of you as coaches may not have had that opportunity to be in the prep room uh, at any point, uh, Hopefully this is just some knowledge shared uh, that you can use to your advantage uh, in order to help your students so that they're not hiding behind the curtain of, of, uh, of the prep room and getting uh, and staying ill prepared. We're trying to help them long term and help you as coaches in order to, to get them focused on the event. So we've shown you some of the things that we often see happening in extent draw that we don't think is all that productive. So what do we think you should do while you wait? Well, we want the extempers, you know, to stay calm, to be relaxed and to stay busy, to keep their minds busy. Because like we said, whenever they fall asleep, then they go into a whole different mindset or when they're playing games, they're in a different mindset. So we're gonna give you some ideas of what we think would help students while they are waiting for their particular speaker position to be called to draw. Um, one thing that would be real easy to do would be to read. Well, I always made sure with my extempers that we had that morning's newspaper, at least one. Now, whenever we would go to state, we would get up early and on our way over to uh, the UT campus, we found a place where we could go and buy like six to eight different daily newspapers, not just Texas newspapers, but there would be the Wall Street Journal there, there'd be the Washington Post, there would be a California, like Los Angeles Times there. And we would buy one of each of those because while they're sitting there waiting, they could be reading their newspapers from that morning. And one of the things that I always appreciated with extempers is when they could come in to give their speech to me as a judge and they're quoting that morning's newspaper. I just think that's real impressive because that tells me that they're focused on what their, what their job is as an extemper and that they've got to support the things that they're going to tell me with actual sources. And so they're giving me that morning's Los Angeles Times or that morning's Dallas Morning News information. And if there's been some big happening during that week, then they've got the latest on what's going on with that. Or maybe we've got, a, maybe you've got a topic that's kind of taking us through a history type thing. And the night before something huge happened with that topic area. And you've got that day's newspaper that you can go through and you can say, according to this morning's Austin American Statesman, and that's going to get my attention as a judge. So I think you need to look at picking up some newspapers from that morning and looking at those while you're waiting. And if not the newspapers, then uh, definitely that uh, that week's news magazines, um, that most recent edition of those. Um, and because we're now in this digital world, it does make it a little bit easier for us if you can't get that newspaper or uh, that week's uh, news magazine. Uh, most of us, at least at the state meet, will have stayed in a hotel uh, that has a business center 
Um, I know whenever I was coaching, we purposely chose our hotel because it had a, uh, a business center that had a printer (laughs) and we could print off articles like crazy. They lost so much money just in our printing of articles and paper in their, uh, in their individual business centers or now in our world, uh, our digital world of, of being able to, to print things, taking a a printer, uh, your own printer with your, uh, your computers in the hotel rooms that night before or early that morning uh, at the very least, have something printed or pick up something printed from that day so that students can actually be working um, before their prep time ever begins. That to us is a productive use of that prep time before the prep time ever starts. We would also try to pick up like a journal uh, that we would carry in our extent files. Uh, and so they could pick up that journal. It may not be that particular you know, months journal, but they could pick up a journal that covers uh, Middle East situations or whatever. Uh, We talked about this earlier, having, uh, you've got your files right there. Why not utilize that prep time by going through? And if there's a topic area that you think about that, okay, I haven't given a a, a practice step speech on this particular topic area, and it's been big in the news this week, then pull up a file and be reading a file don't take notes on it because then you've got a prepared speech, but you can sit there and read and figure out, you know, okay, this is, this is the information that I wasn't sure about. This is what I didn't know about this particular topic. And you never know, you may walk up and then draw your topic and it be from one of the files that you were sitting there reading as you were waiting to, to draw your topic. And along those same lines with those files, remember that even in the digital world, your students are able to highlight in one color, uh, just like they would if it were a printed document. As long as they're staying in that one color uh, within that article, um, they they can legitimately be prepping that, if you will. Um, as far as those files are concerned, too, you might even consider um, those areas that they might have a weakness in just in case those those topics end up uh, being the five that they choose rather than choosing one that they're incredibly comfortable with but actually go to a topic that they uh, that they have that weakness in uh, that can be incredibly helpful as well and then ann ann has a lot of great ideas for you guys uh, concerning other things that they can read involving political books or quotation books yeah, I accidentally hit the, hit the file advance button too quick. Um, I I would see a lot of students as we would walk around the, the draw room. And, and I've worked extent draw at the uh, NSDA National Tournament. I, I ran extent draw for several years for TFA. And I would see students with these books out. On the top row that you see there, those are all political books. And these are from 2021 and 2020. So they are current political books. America on Fire is about uh, police violence. The second book, What Black and White America Must Do Now, it's just uh, talking about what needs to be done about racism in the United States now. The Premonition is about the pandemic. And he kind of takes a look at the political aspect of the pandemic. Uh, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America. This is about leaders that we've had over the last couple, three, four years um, from both both parties to see what are they doing to unmake America. Uh, This is how they tell me the world ends. This particular is about cyber weapons. And we know that cyber weapons are going to be a big, huge thing because of the age of technology that we're in right now. And so this might be a book that students can pull some information from. The last one, The Price We Pay, this is on healthcare. And healthcare, as we know in extent topics, this is a yearly concern and there's always something coming up. So these are books that you could get, have in your classroom, uh, sign them out to students to read or pick one of these and have your extempers assign it as their extra reading for for your class and have them read one of these books. And then they can pull that and quote that book 
in a in a extempore and an extemp speech. I'm also really impressed not only when I hear that day's newspaper, but I can hear somebody quote in the book "The Evil Genius Is the Unmaking of America." Kurt Anderson states, "I just think that's really impressive." I will warn you that the evil genius is is a little bit on the biased side. So just kind of throwing that out there for you. The bottom row then, these are quote books. Now, um, Don't Tread on Me is centered more around uh, democracy and what should happen. I mean, Don't Tread on Me, that should give you a clue as to what that book may cover. Um, my students, The Penguin Dictionary of Modern Humorous Quotations, this was my students' favorite quote book. Mike Stempers loved this particular book because it didn't have the quotes in order of, of the person. It had them by topic areas. And I bet I bought five or six of these books in the last 12 years that I was coaching because they just, they liked them so much that they took them home and used them for their English book reports that they were writing. So great quotes from great leaders. Of course, that kind of tells you words from the leaders who shape the world. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg pocket quote book. I just kind of accidentally happened onto this one uh, at the bookstore where I work. And I thought, you know, so many people admired Ruth Bader Ginsburg that she has to have some good things that she says about our laws here in the United States. And then finally, timeless wisdom. These are just quotes from U.S. presidents. We always carry two or three quote books with us to tournaments. And then I also like somewhere in an extemp speech to hear an extemper take a quote that they could throw in. You know, Abraham Lincoln, even back in his day of being, uh, when he was president, agreed that and would give me a Lincoln quote in there that they could link in with the rest of the, what their topic was. So these are just some simple ideas here. Um, if, you, if you don't have time to write all of these down, let me know. Uh, you'll get my email address here after a while, and I can send you a typed up list of what all of these are. So one of the things that you can be doing is reading while you're prepping, while you're waiting to prep. Secondly is speak. Darren, you want to talk about this a little bit? Sure. Um, so as far as this prep time is concerned, obviously this would be for those speakers who are not the first or second speakers. Uh, these are the ones who are those fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, place speakers uh, in the prep room round. And one strategy that Ann and I have developed is this idea of just giving an impromptu speech, picking a, a, any particular topic. It doesn't necessarily have to be any extemporaneous topic. It's simply to get their, their vocals moving, uh, simply for them to, to get those, those ideas moving in their heads rather than uh, becoming focused on something else. So these are those other alternatives uh, that we would prefer to see in the prep room. Um, and in this case, it could be fun topics uh, in general rather than an actual extent topic. Uh, something that you might could even turn around and end up using it as their attention getting device in their introduction. Yeah, if you pull a, pull a quote from the Penguin's Dictionary of Humorous Quotations, you know, just to have fun with it, but it gets your mind thinking about what's going on in the world and you start working on organization. You could also do like a mini extemp speech over a current topic. Uh, pick a topic that has happened maybe that particular week and do, do like five minutes of research on it and then put together a speech on it. Um, Remember, you shouldn't be writing anything down because if it's not related to the topic that you're going to speak on, you've got illegal material there. But you could sit there and with your files, you don't even have to get up and be moving around if you don't want to. You could sit there and with this particular file pulled up on your computer screen or with your folder there that has all your articles in it, lay those articles out and go through and give an extemp speech, just a little short extemp speech over a really current topic so that you've got those ideas in your mind in case that happens to be a topic that you do end up drawing. Or one other uh, 
speaking ability that uh, or practice that they could be doing is actually taking a speech that they might have given that prior week and they've gotten some feedback from you uh, already. And so in their waiting time, in the prep room, they could be giving that practice speech over and trying to fine tune that speech with what they had actually uh, been given in feedback. Just as, a, as an example of this, I can remember way back uh, my senior year in high school in the state prelims, I actually drew the exact topic that I had practiced with the day before leaving for the state meet. And so that practice speech and all the comments that my coach had given me and feedback, I was able to then use and process. If only I had had an Ann Schaffner in my life at that point who had said, why don't you practice that speech before you ever draw and run that through again, how much better that speech would have been. Um, at the state meet. So uh, definitely repracticing uh, those past topics that they had given earlier uh, could be a great way to utilize their time wisely. Darren, there have been so many times that I have had students who have gone into extemp at a tournament and they have given me, you know, like five to 10 practice speeches the two weeks prior to that tournament. And they come out after giving their speech going, Shawner, two of the five topics I drew were topics I'd already given to you. I just took one of those and just kind of redid that speech with all the things we talked about. So number one, this tells you they should be giving you practice speeches beforehand. And number two, they can take, if they've got plenty of time in that draw while they're waiting, take that speech and re-give it. Now, remember, they can't write anything down. They have to just go off of what they can remember from when they gave that speech. But they could pull the file up again and look over that file before giving that practice speech again. So reading and speaking are two of the ideas that we have for you. This third one is a little out there and Darren has kind of a warning for you on this. And that is take some time to exercise. Now, at the state meet, Ann and I have seen so many uh, traditions and variations and um, really annoying <laughs> uh, <laughs> ways in which students actually do this exercise. Um, but my key warning in any of these that you might encourage your students to do, the key caveat is make sure that your competitors are being respectful of their competitors. Make sure that they are respecting their competitors. I'll repeat this one more time. Make sure that your students are respecting their competitors rather than annoying each other like crazy. And so the first aspect of this exercise is to actually walk around. This can be uh, either before they draw or after they have actually prepared their speech, they can begin walking around the room. Now, obviously the size of the room will dictate just how much they can do this. Um, but man, put that Fitbit on and, and count those steps and uh, get that nervous energy out before they ever uh, leave that prep room. Another one, second one, Ann? Second one is power jumps. Now, if you don't know what a power jump is, I learned this in extent draw. A power jump is whenever you just stand perfectly still and then you jump up. And when you jump up, you pull your knees up. And so you bend your knees up. So that gives you a little bit more power as you jump. What this does is it gets that energy flowing and it gets your lungs to moving and your brain to moving and all. Um, and I will, I'll tell you, I learned this from a young lady who was an extemper that I think she, I may be wrong on this, but I think she was a two-time um, UIL state. Uh, I know a champion one year, but I think two years. She was also in the finals of TFA state. And then her senior year, she was a national finalist at uh, NSDA. And her pattern of, of her preparation was always the same. The last thing that she would do when it was about five minutes before her, uh, her speaker position was called to go give her speech, she would go over, she prepped in tennis shoes, she would go over, she'd put on her high, her, uh, put, put her tennis shoes, make sure she had her tennis shoes all fastened up and everything. She'd put her notes down and she would do five power jumps 
five every time. And I just, I watched her. She would move over where she wasn't being distracting to anybody. She just kind of moved off over to the side in the corner somewhere and did these five power jumps, walked over, sat down, took her tennis shoes off, put her heels on, straightened her suit up, and she was ready to go. So I asked her one time, I said, why do you do that? And she said, it is my final thing that I do that gets my blood flowing good. It gets my energy level up. And she said, while I'm doing those jumps, she said, I am focusing on where I need to be at that point. And I'm visualizing myself in that room, giving that speech. So the power jumps for her work, um, it might not for your student, but they need to find something there that they can do. Um, stretching is something else that they could do. And this would, this would be something that they could walk over to a wall and put their hands up on the wall and push back and kind of stretch their backs and everything. Um, maybe pull their knees up while they're standing and bend their knees. Um, just, you know, open their mouths and get their mouths uh, moving and all. Just whatever it is so that their body is waking up as well as trying to wake their mind up. Uh, Darren, we talked about how to do vocal warm-ups. <laughs> <laughs> the vocal warm-ups are great as long as students do them quietly. Once again, it's that respect, that code of ethics from the UIL uh, that we must encourage our students to follow. And so you may have your tongue twisters. Those of you who are theater teachers may have your other vocal warmups uh, that the students could do. But this is all in anticipation of making sure that those words flow well uh, from their mouths whenever it's game time. And all of these different activities um, can be quite effective as long as they're being respectful of their fellow competitors. And then the other thing, because uh, for so many years, I've also been the, the door monitor at the state meet, um, making sure that your students know if they are gonna maximize their 30 minutes of prep time, they have to go to the bathroom before that 30 minute prep time begins. Once they are prepping, they may not leave the prep room. Um, even in the virtual world this last, uh, a month ago at the state meet, we had students who were asking me virtually if they could go to the bathroom. And we were having to tell them, well, if you haven't prepped, that would be great. Uh, but if you were currently in your prep time and, and we were able to see that, uh, we had to say, no, you have to continue your preparation. You may not officially leave. So please encourage your students to take that bathroom break uh, as soon as the announcements are over, really, uh, but most definitely before they ever start the prep. So we've got three ideas here. One is read during your prep time. Second, speak, give a little speech. Third, do some exercise and get your mind and body all moving together and get that energy level up get it ready to go. So now then it's time to draw. Your speaker position is coming up next. Darren and I both went through this very carefully and talked about this is what we talk to our students about. And I think it's important that those students need to know from beginning to end of their time of draw, what do they need to be focusing on? So we kind of took the prep time and we broke it down into a segment of what needs to be done each time. So the first thing, of course, is you're getting ready to draw. So two minutes before draw, um, these are just some things that, that we both agreed that you need to, to have your mind set on. Um, get your pen ready to go, because when you walk up to draw that topic, you're gonna have to write down uh, your topic number or a few, words from your topic uh, beside your name there so that the monitor knows that this is the topic that you have drawn because those then have to be sent on to um, the uh, your, you'll be taking your topic slip in with you and then those will be checked in tab room to see if this is the topic that you told us you were going to speak on what does your ballot say did you speak on the same topic that you draw that you drawn and I have seen cases where the student has switched their topic 
because they got back to their files and didn't like what they were seeing. So get your pen, get it up there and make sure to sign in. Darren, how does that work with the e-ballots? How did that work this year with signing in? In the virtual world, it made it so much easier because there was less of this preparation time beforehand. You didn't have to write your topic down for anyone. The students were uh, had draw opened up within the uh, the system and they simply clicked on the hyperlink and it automatically threw the topics uh, for them, it threw them to the judges, it threw them to the tab room so that everything was seen. So what Ann and I are talking about here is in a non-virtual tournament, in a live tournament where you are having to keep records, make sure that you have that pen, that you've cleared your stopwatch um, in order to move closer to that front table because the faster that you can be at the front table where those topics are actually drawn, the more efficient it's going to be for your competitors. They're not going to lose any of that 30 minute prep time as long as they are there ready to go at that front table when their speaker number is actually drawn. And as soon as the, the draw announcer says fourth speaker, your student should start the stopwatch there. This was a, a was for me, uh, something that I was never really aware of. I thought each student had their own individual stopwatch and the 30 minutes started once they had drawn their topic. And I learned as I went through high school that that was not the case, that it was a running clock for everyone. And it's definitely that way at the state meet. So as soon as fourth speaker or fifth speakers uh, are called for, your student should start their stopwatch at that, that point so that they see that 30 minutes uh, elapsing. Uh, for them specifically. And at that point, they'll then step forward to quickly draw their topic. Anne and I encourage students to try to select that topic within a minute. When they see those five UIL topics uh, come out of that envelope or in the virtual world offered to them, if they're taking over the minute, they're thinking too long. Uh, on those topics. There's one that's gonna stick out. And if there's not one that sticks out, they better select that lesser of five evils, if you will, in order to get started uh, on that topic. And one of the things, Darren and I kind of differ on this particular idea. I always encourage my students to sit up closer to where the draw table is so that they could get to that table quickly and then get back to their to their files a little bit quicker. And I always felt like that there was less distractions because I felt like most of the distraction is going to go on at the back of the room where people get up and go back there and um, prep. And so I encouraged mine to sit, you know, not right at the very front, but about three or four rows back from where the draw table is. Darren, you're, you took just the opposite on this. Once again, we did the opposite. I encourage my speakers to be at one of the back corners um, and then just listen uh, really well and approach that table as, so that they could be at the table as soon as possible. But then they would be totally away from the draw tables for the rest of their prep time so that they weren't distracted by other students moving past them on their way to and from the draw table. So once again, this is where you as a coach make that decision uh, as to how how and where you want to encourage your students. And it may change from tournament uh, to tournament or from year to year, depending on your students, how distractible some of them may be. But in order to maximize their time, that's where uh, you need to definitely consider some of these decisions uh, before you ever step foot in that prep room. And make sure that they understand that they sign in their topic and they take the topic slip with them. They have to make sure that they do that. So that's about the first couple of minutes and the first the one minute after their name has drawn that they have to pick their topic. Then we go into the research and write segment. And this is going to be for the next 15 minutes. They're going to move calmly back to their files. Notice I said the word calmly. We have seen some students that have picked that topic up and almost run back to where their files are. You don't need to do that. Go calmly back to your files. And very important, put your topic slip somewhere that you can find it later. 
because you're going to have to take that topic slip with you. I always encourage my students that you've got that yellow legal pad there, take that topic slip and slide it up under the binding up at the top of that yellow legal pad, slide it up under there so that the whole time they're prepping, that topic slip is right there in front of them so that if they need to, they can go back and refer to it. I can't tell you how many times we've had students that have come up as they're getting ready to go out to give their speech, have come up and said, I don't know where my topic slip is. And so we've had to go through the other envelopes and try to find that particular topic slip, uh, go through the master list and try to pull that topic for them, uh, all these things. So make sure that they put that topic slip somewhere that they can find it. And then Darren, take it from there on their research. And I can definitely say on that topic slip, I have had a student at the regional meet before uh, who this is in the days pre-computers where files were everywhere and the articles were everywhere. And that that yellow topic slip or green topic slip got slipped into some of the other files. And when they were putting them away, it does nothing but distract your students. It puts them into panic mode when they should be in practice mode when they can't find that. So make sure that that topic slip, that's a great point, Anne, uh, of putting it in that flow pad uh, so that it's easily found. Then you begin your research. There are so many different platforms that you as coaches have available to you, whether it's creating your own PDFs in a Dropbox or uh, and then putting them on a thumb drive um, or using uh, different services that are out there for extemporaneous speaking. Uh, preparation time, but regardless of whichever one or system that you use, this is where your students, this is the meat and potatoes, if you will, of the prep time where they have to be able to research quickly and effectively. And one system that, that I've seen uh, at the state meet, at least, is that when students open an article, they leave that article up rather than closing that article down if they're using it for their citation purposes, because by leaving it up, if they do want to go back and recall something later on in uh, their prep time from that article, they're not having to go through that file recall system. They're able to just spin through it depending on the system. Um, so maximizing that research time with those articles uh, and working through them, uh, incredibly important. Watch your time. And whoever your draw manager is, that person will be calling those time signals out every five minutes, typically. And so if they're watching their own stopwatch, they can get in their zone and they can kind of ignore the what's going on in the rest of the draw room. Uh, but watching their time uh, is incredibly important. And then outlining their speech. There are so many different methods uh, for outlining it. But what Ann and I see mostly at least at the state meet, is the use of a legal pad or that spiral that we talked about earlier and outlining those in whatever form or fashion that you have coached them to do. Um, something that I have noticed, Ann, and I don't know that we talked about this, but for those of you who have a certain speech pattern, the students are allowed to, to have that pattern of the attention getter and the Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three and ABC, however they are subpointing their points. They're allowed to have that model, if you will, uh, pre-written. And a lot of those students will do that before they ever draw, as long as there's no content uh, that's on that outline. Um, so we've seen that work pretty effectively. And because we know that source work is so important in the citation of source work, uh, to back up and give add to that credibility, that ethos within their speech. We've seen um, a lot of methods uh, over the years of doing this. And uh, what I have liked to see uh, on those flow pads is where students may change to a pen color, uh, a red pen color, in order to abbreviate that citation uh, or highlighting that pen color on the flow uh, or that, uh, that uh, source data on the flow so that it sticks out as they are practicing. So those are some great ways in order to uh, to research and to actually write that speech. But stay within that 15 minutes. Uh, whenever I was a speaker, I used to use all 30 minutes for that actual writing of this speech. And now in retrospect, and since I've been coaching and watching at the state meet, um, that's not the way I should have done things at all. I wanted to pack my speech full of content uh, rather than actually 
actually practicing, go figure. It would have been so beneficial to actually practice. And that's where we're headed next. Practice is important. Now, the next seven minutes, this is what you're going to do. You're going to practice your speech. Now, it doesn't matter if you get up and walk around like what we talked about while ago to practice a speech, or if you stay at your seat and you practice it there, but you've got to get that practice time in. That's where you're working on stating your sources and state them in a variety of ways. Don't always say according to, according to, according to. Find a different way. The Dallas Morning News yesterday stated that. Um, you know, find different ways that you can get those sources in there. Work on your introduction and the conclusion. The first thing that the judge is going to hear is that introduction. The last thing they're going to hear from you is the conclusion. So make sure that you tell your students, know what your, your introduction is going to say and how are you going to link that introduction back in at the conclusion of your speech? Don't just think, oh yeah, I can just throw something out there for the conclusion. No, that's the last thing that the judges hear you say. It needs to be organized and prepared. Look at your nonverbals. What are you doing with your hands? Are you doing the extent triangle? Um, are you pacing too much back and forth like, like a, a duck at a shooting gallery? Um, what, are you, what are you doing with your face? You know, are you looking bored? You need to show the audience whenever you give that speech that you care about what you're saying. And so your face also needs to be involved in that speech. And then Darren, I learned this from Darren, and that's the last part of, of your prep time. That's the rehearsal part. The rehearsal to me is perhaps the most important part because if you've used the time allotments as Ann and I have discussed, that leaves you with about six minutes um, at the end of your prep time. And this is where you've gotten all the, the students have gotten all the bubbles, all the, uh, the bumbles out of their speech. And they're giving it again and adding that extra layer of polish, especially in the introduction the statement of the topic, making sure that they have that memorized, especially the stating of their sources so that they flow well. And then in those final words of the conclusion, and if they can add those polish points to those aspects, it's only going to help to benefit them once they walk into that prep room. Uh, and so to me, adding that rehearsal time, it's not just a practice run through it's like the full-blown dress rehearsal at the end of their 30 minutes of prep time now cami i see a question on uh, the chat um and jana if you are on if you will correct me if i'm wrong but cami what i would uh, encourage students to do there is not necessarily have it all pre-done but in that preparation time before they ever start their 30 minutes of preparation, they could then write on their legal pad what they know is going to be their pattern of organization. Not necessarily something that you as a coach would type up and have on a, a blank sheet of paper uh, serving as a model. That, I don't know, would be legit. But as far as the students going ahead and having all of their their Roman numeral system uh, written out on their own flow. That to me is, is more so what I was going for. Right. I'm glad, uh, Darren, can you hear me? I'm yes, ma'am. glad that uh, Cami asked that question because it did raise a red flag as you discussed it. Um, I, I had made a note as well in that um, you would definitely have issues if you had that typed out and that child was just filling those in, because again, that would become that prepared outline. So yes. don't misunderstand what Darren was trying to say in terms of how you teach them, how you coach them in advance. But I would be very careful. That would definitely raise a red flag, I think, with monitors. Absolutely. Good question, Cammie. That was, that was, that's part of my fault too on that because we've seen students sit down and write intro point one, point two, point three, And I knew what, I knew what Darren was talking about, but they're right. You cannot have a pre-typed out outline to follow. Okay. Then what do you do after you finished your rehearsal? You have self-talk and this is what you do in the last 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. 
you go over and you take care of yourself. You've taken care of your speech now. Now go over and take care of yourself. Put on your coat, check your tie, check your hair and makeup. And girls, I would encourage you to put a, a little mirror in your file somewhere, carry it in your purse. Guys, y'all too. I mean, you could look at that mirror and check your tie, make sure it looks good and make sure that the collar on your coat is flipped under. I see so many times extempers come in and male extempers or even female with their jacket uh, collar turned up that needs to be laid back down. And Shame that's something that, go ahead. That's something that Ann and I countless times at the state meet even <laughs> as a door monitor, I've helped kids <laughs> fix their ties and their collars, making sure that that first impression once they step into that contest room isn't ruined uh, by that miscue. Um, so definitely encourage your students to do that. That's right. That's right. Uh, change your shoes. We see a lot of extempers that come in, like the young lady I was telling you about that prepped in her tennis shoes, did her power jumps, and then changed into her high heels. Make sure that you change into your contest shoes. We don't see this happen a lot with the guys, but we definitely, I mean, we see girls in there with some really cute house shoes on that have made Darren and I both laugh. But um, uh, make sure that you change into those contest shoes. Darren, what about the next point there? How important is that? Grab your topic slip in your note card. Um, they must leave the prep room with their topic slip. As if they are using the note card, obviously that would need to go with them as well. Um, but a flow pad is not allowed to go out of that room. Uh, even if it's torn off, some students try to hide it in their, their jacket pocket. That's not allowed. And so typically for me, I have a trash can at the door uh, and I'm telling them as they're leaving, show me your topic slip, chunk the, the flow pad. Um, and so uh, definitely make sure your students are aware of that. And as a result of that, um, the only thing that many of the students of the state meet, I would dare say most students of the state meet who aren't using the note card, they're freaking out about the room number. So just a strategy that, that Ann and I have both seen is to have the students write the room number in which they're going to speak, have them write that on the actual topic slip so that they're not transposing those numbers in their head as they're going upstairs or downstairs or down the hall. Um, it's just a nice way to to ease that panic mode in students by having them write it there. So you've got, you've got your speech ready to go. You're looking good. You've got your coat on, you've got your tie on, you've got your makeup on, your hair's looking good. You have your topic slip that has your room number written on the back of it. And now then, before you walk out of that room, this is when you tell yourself, I'm ready. My uh, college speech coach always, always, would look at us and say, okay, you are ready. Now go have fun. And I need you to walk, talk, and think like a champion. Because if you're in that mode, if you're, if you're carrying yourself in such a way, if you are talking and you've got that speech all set up, like what we just talked with all the practice and then the rehearsal, and then you are thinking about what you're going to say when you get into that round. And, and remember, be sure that you teach your students on the way to their speaking room, they cannot stop and talk to other people. I mean, not even to just go, hey, where are we going for lunch today? No, go straight to your room because then your mind gets off of where it needs to be. But tell yourself before you walk into that room, I'm ready. And I think we're ready now for any questions, Jana, that might be out there. Just looking at the chat, I do see a question from early on uh, from LaDonna that says, is it OK to have their debate information in Google Drive? Jana, would you like to address that one? You're on, Jana, unmute. Actually, uh, Darren, I really thought you would be better to answer that since we're at UT and we're not Google people, but I know that a lot of educators are. So I do know, and I was researching a little bit as you all were 
talking about Google Drive and can you, you know, what can you access often online, you know, because that becomes part of the rule issues as well. So you may be a better person Thanks. or even an audience member, Ryan or Sean, somebody might answer that better. LaDonna, well, from my perspective, Google Drive is an internet based um, area that you would actually be storing your material in. And because of that, the UIL rules don't allow the internet access in the prep room. And so those files shouldn't be in a Google Drive scenario. They should actually be in the thumb drive or in the hard drive of the actual device that's being used. And I would think the same thing would need to be with the debate information so that it's in no way accessible during the extent prep time. Uh, anybody else have an idea on that? I think you're probably, uh, I, I agree with that. Right. Roxanne, I see that idea. Um, I think that is true as well, that you can access Google offline uh, as well, but it is uh, incred an incredible hassle. And from a monitoring perspective, uh, I think you're raising a lot of red flags for potential monitors anytime that you're accessing anything that's Google or search engine-ish uh, within a round. LaDonna, I, I see your feedback there. She says, I'm sorry, I meant debate online that because uh, they should not access it and draw. And she's trying to keep uh, away from having two sets of computers. Uh, I definitely see what you're trying to work with there, uh, LaDonna. I'm not exactly for sure on how you do that logistically, uh, but I would say that a thumb drive uh, with that data would be safer uh, without having to transfer that back and forth, back and forth. Cool. Any other questions? All right. I right. want to thank our presenters today. They bring a great deal of experience in the draw room. And something Darren said that struck me is you're right. We do normally ask coaches to leave the draw room before it starts. So as a coach, you may not have actually been inside to watch that whole process. So I do hope that that has been very insightful, that what they've shared uh, from the things that they see, uh, even at the state level, and that's where your champions are. And so I think a lot of the ideas, I never thought about a power jump, Ann, uh, never coached my students to do that, but I guess if you can do it quietly and be respectful, and, and Darren made a really good point there as well, be respectful, teach your kids to be respectful, not in their own tunnel vision of what's perfect for them, but the fact that they are in a room with multiple people who also have their own traditions and things that they need to be able to stay focused and engage. So teach that respect. I thought that was a great point as well. We want to thank you for attending today. And again, check your email. Uh, if you need CPE credit, it will give you information on how to register for that. Uh, kudos to Ann and to Darren, especially, I think, for pulling off an amazing virtual extent draw this year. It just went, it, it, Darren will tell you, we were probably uh, really, all of us, very nervous about that. I will tell you that Ben Stewart at Speechwire made us much more comfortable. Uh, we did our own little dress rehearsal for it. And I just thought it was phenomenal. I hope all of you who had students at the virtual state meet had that kind of response. Darren and Ann did an exceptional job on making that flow so very, very well. So again, Anna, thank you. Yes. One quick comment. Sean Duffy made a comment over in the chat room. Uh, the answer is no, not before my knee replacement surgery, but after I've had time to heal, yes, I will do a power jump for you. 
<laughs> oh, I missed that, Anna. <laughs> Leave it to Duffy. Thank you for being there for our comic relief, Sean Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> and Don Thompson has a question too. Um, Don, as far as a flow sheet is concerned, what I'm going to encourage you to do is to go to the other sessions here uh, over extemporaneous speaking that Jana is offering through the Capital Conference. And it will talk to you more as far as being a newbie and the different ideas. But a flow sheet's just a fancy word for an outline, teaching students to outline. Uh, their speech and how to organize it. That's all a, a flow sheet is. And Dawn, um, our, my uh, email address is up on the screen right now. And so if you would like to email me and tell me that you'd like to see what a flow sheet looks like, I can draw you an outline of how I taught my students to flow their extent speeches when they're getting ready to practice. And uh, maybe that might help you some. Well, and we're also using jargon from our debate world as well. When we talk about flowing, that really just means writing. So if you are new, we do hope that you will go to the pre-recorded sessions that we have done. You'll see those in the back of your program and online. And those can be watched at any point in time. And also you can receive CPE credit for that. So we have some exceptional pre-recordings uh, that speakers did ahead of time for us. So do take advantage of that. All right, well, again, thank you, Ann. Thank you, Darren, and all the rest of you have a great summer. And we hope you will join us for other sessions that will occur today as well as the rest of the month. Thank you so much.